Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, uh, and this is Global Connections. And we're going to talk about it. Uh, the war against Ukraine is actually the invasion against Ukraine. An update, an update on what is going on there with Carl Baker, a senior advisor of Bar Pacific Forum. Welcome to the show, Carl. Nice to have you. Yeah, good to be back, Jay. It's been a while since we've brought up this subject. Uh, unfortunately, it's still a subject that, that uh, doesn't seem to be going away. Well, let me give you, you know, sort of um, well, uh, an immediate reaction on the whole topic is that the U.S., for its own political uh, reasons, uh, is not giving weapons or money to Ukraine. Um, the EU, uh, thanks to Viktor Orban, is, is kind of stuck about giving money and weapons to Ukraine. And um, Ukraine is having trouble, um, you know, uh, recruiting soldiers, and it's having trouble in terms of the morale of the soldiers. And um, and Russia is uh, through Putin is um, you know still being aggressive, still finding soldiers in prisons, um, still bombing and attacking civilian you know, facilities and residences in at least Eastern Ukraine, but, but expanding that and uh, in violation of all international law uh, as war crimes. And uh, there you go. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't look particularly uh, encouraging. Um, how much of that is right and how much of it is wrong? Yeah, that's a good question, but I'm afraid it's mostly right. And, and certainly there's, there's room for interpretation about what's happening. But I think you know, I think you pretty well summarize it, is that as as we expected, you know, from the beginning, the longer this drags on, the more advantage there is to Russia, simply because of size and, and because of the, the, the ability to sustain a war machine that uh, is is basically the heart and soul of what, what's happening here. And, you know, it's more and more difficult for Ukraine as it continues to depend on the West, which is a fairly fickle on a society when it comes to sustaining a war effort where, you know, as you said, Putin has certainly solidified his position within Russia, and he certainly has been able to sustain the Russian economy in the context of uh, selling oil to India and in uh, China and, and maintaining uh, some level of relationship with, with the Middle East and, and uh, the rest of the global South. So I think you know, certainly it is advantage Russia at this point, and it's uh, it, it's not looking real good in terms of uh, how much longer the United States is going to be willing to support uh, Zelensky as uh, as as a as a hardline uh, position of Russia must be defeated. Hmm. What's the effect? Let's assume just for this discussion. I hate to make this assumption, but. Let's assume that U Ukraine is lost, um, you know, either the Donbass or or more. Yeah, and, but, and then Ukraine, you know, could collapse here. You know, the Zelensky government could collapse, and then all of Ukraine collapses. So let's assume for this discussion anyway that that Ukraine cannot prevail, does not prevail, and the U Ukrainian government is gone. What happens? Well, then then Ukraine is part of Russia uh, again. It's part of it's again part of the Russian Empire, and certainly the rest of the of the former Soviet Union states in Eastern Europe have to be really concerned about the willingness of NATO to defend them. Those that have joined NATO and and those that haven't uh, are, are certainly much more vulnerable than than they were the day before uh, the Ukraine collapsed. What happened to the Ukrainian people if you put a former KGB? officer uh, in charge of it and uh, who is going to be you know, knee-jerk reaction is I have to find anybody who will oppose me and the best test of that is the people who supported Zelensky who opposed the Russian invasion in the past uh, wouldn't there be a lot of mm, Gestapo type of tactics in Ukraine that's possible you know but as I was thinking about this you know I mean let's let's sort of shifted just a little bit here. And what's happening in Donbass? You don't really hear, now this is, a, of course, a function of how much uh, the media manipulates or might be manipulating the stories, but 
in Donbass, where Russia has, in fact, maintained control, you don't really hear a lot about civil dissent. You don't really hear a lot about uh, uh, people being killed for supporting Zelensky or for, for being Ukrainian nationalists or, you know, some version of, of that sort of scenario that you're painting. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think it's quite as apocalyptic as the Western media, at least portions of the Western media are portraying it, that, that it's an either or. If, if, if the Zelensky government fails, the Ukrainian people die in large numbers because of a draconian uh, administration that's put in place by the Russians. I mean, I mean you know, in, uh, in, in Central Asia, next to Armenia, um, there's a, a one dictator who um, struck me as um, Gestapo-like. He said, I have a little list, and when I take over this area, I am going to go through my list and I'm going to take care of all the people that oppose me. So that's part of autocracy, isn't it? You always have a, a, that to some degree. Sure. Um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so I mean, there's certainly there's 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 some people. I mean, could look at the ministers in the in the current government. They would certainly be vulnerable to some sort of a purge by by a a Russian Russian. What's the word I'm looking for? Dictator that gets put in place in Kiev, you know, in this event that that Ukraine collapses. But I'm, I don't, I don't want to keep talking about Ukraine collapsing because I think there's a lot of ways to prevent that from happening, and it may not be full on, full throated support for Zelensky. It may be trying to find some compromise here that allows Ukraine to survive. There was a story I saw the other day that said, uh, and are, are obviously arguing for some sort of negotiated settlement. He said, how much better would it be to have 80% of what is Ukraine today, a European state that has the prospect for joining the EU and joining NATO at some point in the future, rather than sustaining this, this rather difficult situation where you're fighting over over the Donbas and Crimea for the sake of the twenty percent that are in that region, you know. And well, so I think be... I think I would like to frame it that way rather than rather than as the either or, you know, the the, the sort of Manichaean view of one or the other. Well, um, let me add some fuel to that fire, though, and point out that um, you know not only. Has, has Putin taken steps to insinuate power, his power, into other countries? Uh, and Belarus is, is, a, is a prime example, but, you know, there are four or five others uh, all the way to Romania, and, uh, where he has, um, you know, put his agents in, done, um, done uh, misinformation on the media, social media especially, where he has fomented unrest, if not chaos, uh, and where he has signaled directly or indirectly that he wants that country and he wants to turn them in favor of Russia without firing a shot. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, that's been clearly the case in a number of those countries, uh, which uh, would would be next on the list, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you be concerned uh, that if a deal is made, if um, Ukraine goes soft in some way, that those countries would be next. I mean, if he's going to resurrect, um, you know, either the monarchy or, or the USSR, uh, he's going to be after them next. It's all Eastern Europe at risk. Huh? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I accept that, that that is a risk. But what I'm suggesting is that to mitigate that, what is what is the best way to mitigate that risk is 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 to to continue to fight for the 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 piece of Ukraine that's east of the Donbas, or is it to actually, you know, develop some resilience in those, in those regions that you can control, that you're not fighting a, a ground war against, against a Russian military that almost by its nature is always going to be superior because you have a bigger population, you have a bigger industrial base, you have, you have an economy that, that has 
maintained its integration into the into the global economy you know or you know do you continue to to put all your marbles in the zelensky objective of returning all the territory that was at one point ukraine yeah no and i, I mean i think that that's, nothing yeah yeah i think i think that's really the dilemma that i see and and that's why i'm of the of the mind that you know, I think we need to start being a little more realistic about what are our objectives. You know, and that, of course, is is what's coming out of, you know, the the, the, the debate, the the funding debate in the United States is is what exactly is our objective here? Yeah, that or that because what happens here has a huge, if not dispositive, effect on what happens there. And but the same, you know, the same analysis: what happens in the EU. Uh, and Western Europe um, also has a positive effect. And I'm reminded, and I want to come to American, the American political situation in a minute, but um, Viktor Orban, who was uh, Putin's friend um, and an autocrat all by himself, done a really good job of becoming an autocrat, uh, vetoed a, a move by the EU to give X billions of dollars to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And I get two reactions on that. The first reaction is... Uh, you know, it's so predictable, but it, it re reflects a, a lack of um, unity among the countries in the EU. It's, just, it's a moral choice, and, it, and he is predictably going to oppose a moral choice. The other aspect of it is uh, if Russia, if um, Germany and France and others uh, feel so strongly about it, why don't they just write a check? Why do they need Victor Orban to write a check? I'm not sure they did that. Your thoughts? Yeah, no, I agree that 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 it certainly is is the case that that there is there is not consensus consensus in the European Union, and the European Union, of course, is an economic focused organization. It's not it's not a security focused organization. So, you know, yeah, I mean, Germany and and France they they have the capacity to provide military assistance. The UK does, you know. So there's there's European countries that can can fill. That security assistance role. The, the the real the real issue though is to what end? Are you know are you going to go back and 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 you know try to try to take the Savorican line? You know are you try are you going to try to sever that bridge between Crimea and 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 the, the Russia? You know what what are your military objectives? Let's 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 deal with that first because I think that that's what's becoming the important problem here. The money, the, the money problem is is almost secondary at this point, because right now what's what's happening is you you you're stuck in a military stalemate. Now there's some who say, oh, it's not a stalemate. There's it's just going to take another two years before we get the Ukrainian military up to the capacity to actually execute its counteroffensive. You know, well, boy, those are a long two years. You know, and and. So, you know, so it becomes more and more difficult to see how do you get past this military conflict? And, and when you start talking about the, the, the EU, really, the EU is about the economic support. But, but Ukraine's problem right now is not economic support. It's, it's really about me being able to maintain some sort of security apparatus. What about technology? You know, technology is a moving target. Um, and uh, I keep thinking of uh, uh, the use of AI. Israel is, is uh, reportedly using AI in dealing with the fight in Gaza. Um, and uh, for that matter, Israel also has uh, at least um, experimental laser equipment that will, you know, burn something out of the sky uh, cheap. It's not as expensive as a missile. It's just a beam of light. Uh, and so, you know, anything could happen on technology. And, you know, the world is always interested in technology. And, and the stakes are high when, you know, the technology can be weaponized. And I'm, I'm wondering uh, if that, that might happen within, you know, less time than two years, uh, which would change the focus of all of this. What do but, you think? But what technology would change the, the, the situation on the ground in Ukraine is a, is a bit of a puzzle to me. I mean, because, I mean, we've seen, we've seen technological innovation, you know, just the whole idea of how they've been utilizing drones, you know, both, both sea drones 
by the by the Ukrainians as well as as well as you know air drones by by Russia and and to some extent Ukraine. You know, so so those kinds of technology advances are there, but I don't I don't really see how how some technological advance in the next two years is going to change the security situation in the territory that we call Ukraine today. Uh, you know, I mean, I, there's there's just some some facts that are are there that that aren't going away, and and one is that it's going to be very difficult for Ukraine to to penetrate that defensive line, the the Savorican line that's been created to to maintain that land bridge between Russia and and Crimea. So if that's your objective, if your objective is to is to take back all that territory. That's a problem that you have to deal with, and I don't see a technological solution to that. Next, if you look at, you know, the the uh, the, the the whole idea of of uh, long range attacks on Russian territory, you know, you, you've you've seen uh, Ukraine trying to attack uh, Russian cities, Belgorod, on the on the on the border, and and then. In response, you know, the Russians have been attacking as far away as Lviv. You know, I don't see how the technology. You, you maybe have hypersonics or something that might be able to to penetrate the air defenses better than than what you have now. But again, that's not that's a technological advance that that could affect you know specific battles. But I don't see it again affecting the the broader security situation on the ground where you you ultimately have a, a ground offensive stalemate. And stalemate is the operative word. The stalemate means that both sides are in stalemate. It, it assumes that. And so, uh, and both sides are in a, in a war of attrition, I think. I mean, I don't think um, Putin is really gaining, um, you know, beyond the attrition. Uh, and certainly Ukraine is, is experiencing the attrition in many ways, uh, in, in terms of soldiers and in terms of supplies and in terms of the uh, the, the morale of the army and the people, um, it's, it's just very hard on them. The country has been largely, you know, uh, damaged already, um, and they're not getting the kind of support they want. It must be a very hard on the individual Ukrainian. Yes, so, I, so and Zelensky. So my question is: Are they are they both ready to deal? Are they both ready to reach an agreement? Well, I, I think I think the the Ukrainians are certainly more ready. Uh, I, I think uh, I, I think the Russians. I think Putin is is ready, but there's some assumptions there, and and that is that he is going to gain territory. I mean, I think it, on based on that, I think that's where Russia is ready. That that he does he does get his win. In the sense that he basically maintains the territorial conquests in the Donbas and and Crimea, and I think that that and then that's the, that's the unpalatable unpalatable part to to Zelensky and a lot of people in the West who say this sets the bad precedent, and then and then we get the narrative that you provided recent just just a few minutes ago about well then what's next in in Romania and and all the other Eastern European countries. Uh, this is, this reminds me of uh, of Israel because if I were uh, at that table trying to make a deal representing Ukraine, I would say, "What what assurance do we have um, that you won't do this again?" Mm -hmm. um, because you know there are many indications that you will do it again to us and to others, um, and I suppose um, part of that could be, and this would depend on third party agreement. Uh, that that uh, the remaining part of Ukraine becomes a part of the EU, that it is an even part of NATO. Mm. But that, that depends on the members of the EU, including Viktor Orban, uh, and um, NATO, which may or may not be agreeable. Uh, mm. Turkey, for example, may not be agreeable. Um, so clearly, I mean, what assurances could Russia give or could Ukraine demand that it won't happen again and couldn't? Could that demand include these points? Yes, it could. I mean, th those are the those are the two obvious points. Now, of course, how those are become enforceable is a, is a fair question because now, obviously it's going to be very difficult to to provide that guarantee without without some sort of force on the ground. So, but I think you know, I think 
the way that would have to work is that there would have to be the implicit understanding that Ukraine then is offered the deterrent effect of becoming part of NATO. You know, and, and so it, it's not it's not necessarily explicit in the agreement itself, but it's implicit in the sense that it is now covered under Article Five by by joining NATO. And I think that that would be that would be the part that would be the enforceability aspect of that of that kind of agreement. Don't you but wonder about it? Wouldn't be direct; it would be an indirect sort. Of thing. So don't you wonder about Article Five these days? You know, everybody refers to Article Five. You attack me, I attack them, whatnot. Um, but you know, um, a lot of time has gone pa- by since Article Five was originally written down, and I and you have to wonder whether Article Five would actually, in fact, come into play. I mean, whether the members of NATO would really respect it. Your thoughts? Oh yeah, I mean, if you think about a small town in Latvia, somewhere close to the Russian border. Uh, are we really prepared to <laughs> to uh, fulfill our obligation in Article Five? Well, maybe this is just a little bit of a bad example. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, the red lines are always are always dangerous, aren't they? Aren't they? Yeah, so, especially if they're historical and um, you know yeah. and impractical too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that, that you're, you're, I know. I fully agree with you that that the whole the whole Article Five argument. Gets uh, you know, and this of course is this is this this is the argument from the beginning, from the '90s when we started talking about which uh, Eastern European countries really should be included in NATO, given given the ironclad guarantee that we keep offering in the context of Article Five. And but um, what about people? You know, Zelensky disappeared off the table, assassination, what have you. Or vice versa, you know, Putin, um, maybe he is sick, maybe he becomes, uh, you know, incapable. Um, how would that change things? I mean, is there a successor to either of them? Well, no, I, I, that, that's a, a, a very good, uh, very good point is, especially, I mean, with Putin, uh, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know enough what is happening in Russia. You know, what, what, what would really happen if Putin was suddenly gone? Uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that there's probably somebody, somebody in the wings that could, could take over. It wouldn't be Prigozhin, but, uh, you know, it could be, it could be someone, someone out lurking in the, in the background. But yeah, as, as far as Zelensky, you know, what I see is a real vulnerability for the West right now is, is the full acceptance of Zelensky as the, as the only partner who can deliver uh, Ukrainian freedom, you know, and, and, you know, one of the things I think that Ukraine should be doing right now is they should be working very hard at building a narrative about how they are actually engaging in reform and, and working on some of the, some of the corruption that we know is still there and, and building some resilience in their democratic institutions. And, you know, and so I, right now, I don't think that's there. And so I think both sides are vulnerable to, the, the, the sort of iconic strongman that have, that has been the focal point of of the conflict. Before we leave Europe and go to the U.S. here in this discussion, I I want to uh, mention I saw an article criticizing the EU, criticizing NATO for not anticipating that that they should be producing more more ammunition, uh, and they haven't, and they're uh, unable to even, even if they were. Um, even if they decided to provide, you know, unlimited amounts of ammunition to Ukraine, they don't have it because um, apparently this kind of war uh, uses a lot of ammunition. They mm-hmm. they they just fire up thousands of shells and rockets all the time. Then the other aspect is that Russia doesn't have it either. Russia has to get it from Iran um, and also from North Korea. Uh, and maybe elsewhere. And yeah. so the ammunition becomes an issue. Uh, and just to touch on the U.S., the U.S. doesn't have it either. We, we we have not planned this war. We have not planned to support this war. And our military industrial establishment doesn't have the ammunition here either. We may have a lot of troops. We may spend $800 million a year on the military. 
but we don't have enough ammunition to actually get into a shooting war. So how does that affect things? Well, I mean, again, I, I mean, it, it plays into the stalemate because neither side has the capacity to, to make a decisive strategic move that would require more of that munition, more of those munitions that they don't have. So you end up with the, you know, with the skirmishes around the towns, you, you move, you know, you move the, you move the, the line of, of control a few meters, a few kilometers over the span of a month. You know, I mean, it, it, that's, and that's why, it, you know, it, you look back at what happened in Korea, you know, we spent, we spent basically two to three years doing that, sitting, sitting, you know, moving, moving one mountaintop, you know, one hill to the next hill. And, you know, and in some ways that's where we are in Ukraine right now. It's, it's just that the land is a little bit flatter, but, but I mean, basically we're in this stalemate where, yeah, you use the munitions you have. But you can't really make a decisive move because you you don't have the sustainability on both sides. It, it's true for both sides. Okay, let's move moving to the United States, which is probably the most interesting part of our discussion because the United what the United States does or doesn't do will have a, a, a profound effect on how this plays out. Um, and um, I, I'm not sure they you know as. As opposed to the Middle East, I'm not sure the United States is actively involved in trying to negotiate a settlement. It it, it could be, should be, might be, but right now, no. Right? Yeah, there's there's been a lot of questions about about how much we are. And I mean, I've seen stories that says we are, and and the reason that you don't hear about it is you can, because they've been very unsuccessful. And so we'd rather not uh, portray ourselves as being unable to pers to pursue that. And so. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of questions about what's what's happening in the United States, and you know, I I know that you know I mean, the the Republican the Republican version is is not unsurprisingly sort of two faced, where on the one hand it says Biden's not being strong enough, and on the other hand they're the ones that are responsible for not providing more more money for for the for the munitions that you're talking about because they want the deal on the, on the border, you know? So, so I think that there's a lot of uncertainty in the United States. And again, I'll, I'll go back and say, you know, I think that we have really sort of hitched ourselves to Zelensky's, uh, maximal demands, and it's going to become more and more difficult for us to, to move away from those, those demands as we begin to realize that this is a stalemate and stalemates don't play to Ukraine's favor. This hurting Biden, I mean, everything that happens in all of these 10 months now to follow before the election, everything he does or doesn't do is going to have, you know, it's going to present a target for the Republicans, but it's also, you know, objectively going to have an effect on public opinion and thus the vote. Um, so query, um, is this helping him? But my, my thought is maybe not. No, I don't think it is. You know, like you said, I mean, the, the Republicans, they, they can attack on, on several different fronts and they have, you know, I mean, you, you can't be strong enough and yet you're, you're not, we're not going to give you the money because you're not compromising with us on something else. And so, you know, so he's completely vulnerable to the opposition, which is understandable, but also to the broader general uh, public opinion. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the, the great fear that we had from the beginning about the weariness of the United States, feeling like they're the ones who are having to defend Ukraine. Europe isn't providing enough. You know, it's all that same rhetoric and all that same narrative that's coming back to us again. And so, yeah, it, it hurts. It hurts the in, the incumbent president in in a situation where you are you are caught up in in a in a stalemate that has no clear resolution without clear objectives. Yeah, the background is, as you say, uh, when Trump was speaking to this issue, he was saying, let's, let's be isolationist, let's stop funding NATO, uh, let's stop funding the war, and let this be realized. I mean, I think Trump or Trump's thinking has uh, a huge effect on Mike Johnson and, and the Democrats uh, in the House and so forth. <clears throat> but, you know, you, uh, uh, you, you wonder if that's a, a good idea for the United States. Because uh, we we will be affected by the result, and um, the isolationism that that Trump uh, was was you know was selling 
back at the beginning of his term um, and later during his term. And and now, indirectly, Trump is controlling, I think, the Republican policy on this. Uh, this is his position. We see expressed through Mike Johnson. Um, and, you know, that... Um, and, and then his statement, Trump's statement is, you know, you, 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 know you, you, you elect me and I will stop this war immediately. Yeah, right. With, with a, you know, a golden, a golden platter to uh, Vladimir Putin, he'll stop it all right. Um, but I think people buy that because they don't want troops, our troops to be on the ground. They don't want us to spend our international capital, you know, and, um, and be the world's policeman. Well, yeah, I think that's true. Although, you know, I, I think you're giving credit a little too much credit for to Trump for having thoughts and ideas. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm not sure that I'm quite willing to to buy that. I mean, it, uh, you know, in some ways, you know, the Republicans have been fairly fairly nihilistic about this whole thing. I think where where, like I said, they they, they argue they argue two ways. You're not being strong enough, and I think I think Trump's uh, response would probably be, "I'll I'll eliminate it because I'll they'll be afraid of me because I'm I I will present this this great strong America that everyone will fear and so people will drop their guns and uh, come and be be uh, beholden to me because I'm I'm the powerful powerful figure that I am, you know and and then you have the other side that says, well we, we want to get something out of you guys for the border." So we're we're not going to provide funding, you know. So I mean, there's real. That's really two different different approaches, uh, and and then and then you're right. Then there's the third approach that says, well, as long as you're doing it, we don't want to support American adventures. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that what's happening on the border is similar, in its own way. It's a it's a mirror image of what's happening, um, you know, in Ukraine. What I mean is. Uh, and this goes to Joe Biden's statement the other day. So you you want me to do something at the border, but you won't give me any money to do it. I do have a policy. I do have a plan. But you're blocking that, and then you're blaming me for not blaming me for not doing anything. Um, this is not the way to shape American policy. Um, and I and I wonder your thoughts about the notion of hitching the Ukraine wagon to the border issue. Uh, it sounds to me as disingenuous at the least. Oh, I mean, that's that's part of the reason why I use the word nihilistic because the, oh, there's no connection. There's there's literally no connection between those two. It's it's really just a matter of of taking taking a problem that you have and saying, well, we have a problem and we want you to solve that problem first. Uh, you know, I mean, there's no there's no there, there's no connection. It's it, it's 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 completely nihilistic to, to, to try to connect those two uh, or to connect it to, to, I mean, in some ways to, to Israel, you know, I mean, to, to try to connect the three is uh, there's, there's no, there's no rational basis for doing that. This is something new in American foreign policy, if you will. Uh, in other words, you, yeah. you hitch a, um, a domestic issue to a foreign policy issue uh, and you and you force the other side to have to consider that before you do what is obviously the right thing on foreign policy. Am I right? You know, what has yeah, happened but, before? This well, uh, but but the the broader the broader issue that you're talking about that you're right, it's new. But what's happened is you know we've we've sort of let this norm of don't let domestic politics influence foreign policy. You know that was very much a strong norm. And remember. Early in the Trump or first Trump administration, people were talking about this. We said this is a very dangerous way we're moving here, where we're connecting domestic politics with foreign policy. You know, at one point, you know, I remember there was a statement that said no one has ever made a derogatory statement about a foreign policy issue on foreign soil, and someone in the early in the Trump administration did exactly that. You know, and and so I think, yeah, this is this is what happens when you destroy those norms. Is now you, now it comes back and and it becomes a a policy approach in the politics of America, and that's why we don't we shouldn't have done that. And yeah, now you see the unprecedented situation where you do have a a a domestic issue 
or, or a foreign policy issue being held hostage to a domestic hostage. It's a world of hostages these days. And it's also a world of stalemate. You know, in this conversation, it seems to me we have stalemate between Russia and Ukraine. We have stalemate in Congress. Um, we have stalemate on the border issue. Um, everything is stalemate, everything. And you you can't run a railroad that way or a country, I think. Um, so that's you why I'm asking. Run, you can run two echo chambers that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, stalemate. Yeah, yeah and, and, and it just exacerbates the stalemate. <laughs> so my, my final question to you is from a foreign policy point of view, uh, an American policy point of view, a global world order, and a, a liberal global world order point of view, what in a, in a perfect world, without holding issues, domestic issues, hostage for international foreign policy, what is the proper foreign policy on on Ukraine? What should the United States do? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go back and say it again. The United States should be thinking about how to develop a solution to the problem that allows Ukraine to maintain some level of independence, a sovereign state that is associated with Western democracy and Western institutions through the European Union, through NATO, the security and economic institutions of Europe that, that provides some resilience in Central Europe to, to support the, the global international order that the United States desires to ensure that we don't lose other countries to Russian adventures. And we, we maintain a, a status in Ukraine that demonstrates the value of aligning with the European countries and showing that there are benefits associated with that, that global liberal order. And the way we do that is we build a, 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 a agreement, a, a resolution to the conflict that does support a, an independent uh, Ukraine that, that isolates Russians, Russians' gains because there's going to be there's going to be Russian gains at this point, short of, of annihilating Russia. And I don't see that happening. So I think that the, the, the realistic foreign policy goal should be to salvage what we can in Ukraine and then work to build that resilience by demonstrating the value of maintaining a relationship to the world mm. in, in, I, very broad, in very broad terms. And, and that has to do with how we do the reconstruction. It has to do with how we, how we allow Ukraine to integrate into the Western economy. You haven't mentioned the United Nations, and I think that's for a good reason. And we just let that one hang in the air. There's nothing the United Nations can do with the Security Council formed up the way it is. No, that's a whole separate. That's a whole separate foreign policy issue that the United States can can tackle once it's done with more existential problems. But it, it clearly, clearly, what we need is we need serious attention to reform of the of the United Nations and specifically the Security Council. And last question, you, you, in terms of American policy to Ukraine, uh, in the interim, while we're working to the goals you described, what about sending them money? What about, if you had the perfect world, what about sending them money? What about sending, sending them arms, which, we, which Joe Biden wants to do? Would you do that? Sure. Yeah, I mean, you, have, you, you, can't, you can't just cut off funding and say, no, Settle, settle, you know, settle for peace or settle for for some compromise. There has to be there has to be some demonstration that Ukraine can sustain the stalemate. I mean, I think that's the concern. That's the immediate concern I would have is that Russia believes that it it can prevail in the stalemate, and that's you can't you can't let that happen. You have to you have to provide some level of support to Ukraine to allow them to to sustain the stalemate. And to convince Russia that it really is in Russia's interest to to settle and accept the fact that there's going to be compromises in that settlement that include a very close alignment of Ukraine with with European uh, interests. I mean, wow, so many issues. 
Carl Baker, Senior Advisor, Pacific Forum, thank you so much for this discussion and your thoughts on so many issues. Appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Aloha. Aloha.